This is a call for peace uh, between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Please immediately we withdraw from the territories and uh, stop any kind of hostility. The 27th of September, yesterday, I record this uh, video now on Monday, is really a reminder how terrible wrong armed conflict is to solve territorial issues in Europe. And the Southern Caucasus is Europe. Please, you want to work with us? You want to be our partners and friends? You are in the Eastern Partnership. The EU is funding a lot of activities in Armenia, Azerbaijan and Caucasus. It's a very uh, um, strategic and important region for Europe. And uh, this is really utterly wrong that uh, there is uh, this war escalating now in September 2020. And it's really something I call on all parties really withdraw uh, towards the positions of the 26th of September and stop all hostilities. And let's now discuss in this video, I will explain exactly how peace in the Southern Caucasus can be done. I call it Benelux. That's already that direction uh, to uh, go, uh, what I will explain. Because we have many, many such conflicts in Europe. From the Benelux countries uh, to uh, the German-Italian-Austrian issues, the Polish-German, uh, the Danish-German issues. It's completely wrong to think that only the Caucasus is complicated. Yeah. In Europe we have over 20 uh, ancient territorial ethnic religious disputed regions, even more maybe, who uh, we have solved. You don't hear about it. I was in conferences in, in, uh, in Kiev when I lived there. And that it was really unbelievable. There was political scientists from the Southern Caucasus who said, oh, you Europeans, you don't know exactly how terrible our conflicts are. As if we wouldn't have had any Southern Tyrolean issue or German minority issues uh, between Poland and uh, Germany, between uh, Germany and the Sudetenland. <laughs> you know, we had German minority issues with Belgium. The whole issues of Catalonia, the whole issues in the Balkans, obviously, um, powder cake by excellence. But now we have gradually solved all these issues. And why we did it, how we did it, this is important. See, the reasons why you don't hear about it anymore is because we settled these complicated and toxic issues in a very reasonable, decent uh, manner over time. And you know, there was a lot of bloodshed in Europe. I don't have to call back all the European history. But now we have managed. And this is the same way also I call on the partners and the friends from Armenia, Azerbaijan and Georgia to stop the fighting. It's anyhow completely useless because none of you has sufficient international backing to be successful. Both uh, sides are enough armed uh, to harm each other, but not uh, have no capacity to really impose a settlement on each other. And as you don't have any kind of um, ability to, um, uh, uh, for a decisive victory, neither Azerbaijan, which maybe has the more modern weapons, nor Armenia, uh, which uh, has probably a more mobilization power behind it, and, but also a territorial air advantage of this very mountainous Karabakh region. You know, there will be no the idea that any side can really impose an uh, armed settlement now in 2020 without any, having any superpower backing. And nobody will back you. And Turkey will not be sufficient support uh, for, the, um, for the Azerbaijanis. It will not really intervene uh, militarily. And uh, for Armenia, it will be no uh, real support from Russia, besides uh, tweets and money maybe and weapons. Uh, Russia will sell weapons to both sides and it will be a complete mess and nobody will win militarily. So I call for peace, I call for European settlements and I call that this conflict will be ended. Let's see some of the details and understand a little bit where we are. Here we have this tweet of uh, the Prime Minister of Armenia calling for the fatherland, for victory, for I call on the personnel attached to the troops to present themselves to the district commissariat, huh? general mobilization, martial law. Is this the European Armenia, the hero of 2018? I mean, what kind of language, what kind of grandstanding? 
And the same is on happening obviously on the Azerbaijani side. I mean, are we in the 19th century? Anyhow, it needs to be understood. I always uh, see the suspicion who is really benefiting from such a conflict. I think it's obviously Russia. They have now, they wanted a new escalation in the Southern Caucasus in order to deflect from the various crises there are. <coughs> I'm sorry, from, um, from Navalny to Belarus. And another front always shows how fragile the Eastern European is, reminds how important Russia is as a peacemaker. And Putin wants now to portray himself as the one who made peace in the Southern Caucasus. And therefore he has fooled this com uh, conflict before. And I call on Russia not to <laughs> do that because it's so obvious. Everybody understands it. And it's uh, really utterly wrong. And let's come a little bit, you know, to the history as well. Russia has actually occupied in this whole region, uh, more or less, uh, during the Napoleon times. And then uh, until the, um, 1864. This was basically none, no Russian was living in this area. It was all very diverse ethnicity, from Circassians uh, to Azeris uh, to Armenians, you know, Georgians. It is all a huge... Uh, um, collection of ethnicities, over 20, maybe 30 ethnicities uh, living in the Caucasus region and obviously uh, only Russian uh, brutality and arms uh, could uh, succeed in a way to unify or pacify it if they, you want to use colonialize. It was basically the area of Russian colonialism per excellence and of Russian brutality. You can read about the Cherkessian genocide they committed. Yeah? And it's quite uh, tragic and of course you know the Soviet Union uh, as powerful uh, um, a union as it was, it has and, uh, so a brutal totalitarian state has suppressed all these conflicts and then when it fell immediately it started again. Yeah? And obviously then the new uh, Russia afterwards has used these conflicts from Abkhazia to Chechenia uh, to uh, Ossetia and uh, now Bergkarabakh obviously to divide and rule in this uh, fragile um, surrounding. I remember the 27th of September is also the day of the Sukumi massacre. That was the massacre uh, ending, uh, the, also the, not ending, but one of the, when uh, Georgia lost the Abkhazian war in 93, there were a lot of people killed in Sukumi, a terrible day in history. And now, 17 years later, or 20, uh, 27 years later, Again, the 27th of September, uh, this terrible escalation on between Armenia and Azerbaijan. So, it's not necessary to go for all the history. Obviously, everybody knows the two Chechen wars. And uh, what we need to do now, in my view, is uh, to, to have a clearer perspective, a dialogue between all three countries for European cooperation and integration not into the European Union and NATO, that's only possible for Georgia, but for the two other party, uh, part, uh, partners, Eastern partners, we need to invest much more, we need to help them, we need to integrate them, and we have to avoid such kind of a proxy wars in our region, because they are very harmful for the people there, but also for the general peace in Europe, it's a very strong thing, a strong, uh, terrible um, reality to have such escalations suddenly popping up and we were totally aware that this is happening. Don't forget that already I have uh, answered so many tweets of uh, the Aceres and Armenians who were fighting on Twitter uh, the whole time now, the whole year 2020 already. During the corona crisis obviously it's ten uh, temptation for all uh, authoritarian regimes uh, to use that a little bit as a as a kind of a deflection strategy and you know that it was an open issue and all sides were interested in escalation it seems tragically the case because it was going on Twitter like on and on I think the whole year 2019 already and we had already real rockets flying on the 15th of July it was a real escalation day and then 10 weeks later we have another escalation and even we're talking about Armenian-Azerbaijan war now. And uh, hopefully it will be stopped immediately. But it's really a tragedy that uh, under our watch, you know, in 10 weeks after that escalation on the 15th of July, the next thing comes in autumn. 
and everybody is surprised. Oh no, we didn't know there was go some, something going on. What exactly has European, NATO and Western diplomacy done in the last 10 weeks to make sure nothing is escalating? I mean, this can be really asked of our diplomats and our, our political elites to really uh, be active and avoid sudden escalations like that and then surprises. Oh, we didn't know that is happening. Yeah. Anyhow, I don't want to uh, accuse anybody for starting it because that's a very contentious issue. Everybody says, of course, the other side has started. Yeah, But it seems that uh, Azerbaijan has led uh, the military uh, confrontation now in a vain effort to think uh, that this uh, Azerbaijan can pursue unity by force. Yeah. Of course, you know, this is ter um, Bergkarabakh is uh, officially a Seri territory and it should be also reintegrated one day. But by peaceful means, by convincing the people there, uh, mostly now Armenians, that they um, will have a, a decent uh, future in a free federal market economy called Azerbaijan. I mean, it's very hard to imagine that you impose your will militarily then occupy this area and start ethnic cleansing and everybody applauds you. That's not going to happen. <laughs> you will find nobody to support you. And uh, the whole comparison with Uluya operation in, Srebren uh, in Srebrenica and all this uh, Croatian unity thing of 95, it's very, very wrong. Because there was no recent genocide uh, committed by the Armenians. Yeah? There is a case for Azeri unity but uh, based on a real um, successful offer approved by the people who live in Bergkarabakh. There will be unity, I'm confident, yeah? but on a very decent uh, way and not on a military conquest way, which anyhow won't be successful. And secondly, it's, uh, you will not be internationally recognized and there will be no support. It only leads to massive escalation further. And then <laughs> it's a total mess. And it's not a valid comparison, because in Oluya, that's the Croatian unity, uh, it was first uh, the Srebrenica genocide by the Serbs. And then the US really supported the Croatians for unity, and it was justified. And it was the right thing to do at that time as a response of the circumstances of the terrible crimes committed by the Serbs in Bosnia. And uh, then also the NATO has intervened. But it is uh, not only different times, but a different region and completely different circumstances. So the way to achieve a Seri unity and for the Bergkarabakh is uh, based on Benelux, peaceful cooperation, a offer, a constitutional guaranteed international supervised offer for the people in Bergkarabakh or Aktash to live freely and securely under European peace and rights. And that's the way to do that. And that's how we solve these things, and not by arms. Yes, I have already made the case here about uh, the conflict. Maybe, you know, if you are deeper interested, you can see also these are the regions of Azerbaijan. It's very complex, actually, quite interesting. It's worth a look, because Armenia here on the west, and then you have one region uh, of uh, Azerbaijan, which is actually not even at all connected uh, to uh, by land um, to Azerbaijan, and then you have this Nagorno-Karabakh region. I mean, it's quite obviously to explain not only in terms of free market uh, and federalism, but uh, you know, in terms of Austrian federalism. These are nine regions. Eight are under Azeri control, one not. Yeah? So it's pretty obvious. It turns form into a federal state like Austria, and let's say Nagorno-Karabakh is uh, in a way the Vorarlberg or the Tyrol, And then, uh, you know, then you make a federal constitution with a um, very special status for Nagorno-Karabakh with international guarantees under UN, NATO and all um, powers there might be. And then uh, to have um, this kind of package, it can be compared with the South Tyrolians. Yeah? And that is basically the way to do such a thing and then to make an international agreement, to have enough donor funding to make peace and to buy everybody into compliance and then unity is possible. But for this, Azerbaijan must be a real uh, European democracy. That's the real task. Yeah? Who wants to live 
uh, and to be kindly invited by tanks <laughs> to join uh, Azerbaijan again when they might think that their future will be quite terrible and they will be expelled. I think it's not a proposition anybody will easily accept. So I call for European Armenia. We had this revolution in 2018 and I have made um, millions of tweets, I know this exaggerated thousands of tweets about the topic, you know, Armenia to join the regional cooperation council, the energy community, it has already started, and to do a real DC FDA. Obviously, Armenia leave all these links with Russia, uh, with the uh, Eurasian Union, it's anyhow failing. Armenia to back to the, uh, the tram, that's the currency of Armenia, like Bulgaria and North Macedonia, and then uh, to cut the taxes to 10% like North Macedonia, build a strategic partnership with North Macedonia, recognize Republic of Kosovo and the Albanian genocide, and then obviously we should officialize the EU, uh, should officialize the uh, um, commemoration date, the 24th of April for the Armenian genocide, a terrible disaster, and also federal Armenia to uh, develop into 11, 11 uh, stronger regions, and then uh, European Southern Caucasus Benelux for infrastructure, to basically join the Berlin uh, dialogue for the Balkans and also involve Turkey in that one and because that's also a EU task and a NATO task to get a mediation going between Turkey and Armenia via its membership in the Balkans. And uh, that's very much better. I called, you know, I made this slide in the spring 2020. It's so relevant, I can <laughs> not believe it. And then it's also very clear, uh, very clear, have a strong role of the UN, OSD, and secured peace uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan and the South Tyrolean uh, status of Nagorno Karabakh. But uh, clearly, you know, that cannot be otherwise solved. Yeah? as a federal state of Azerbaijan. Nobody will do any land swaps, nobody will endorse any kind of territorial exchanges on any kind of territorial expansionism of Armenia. You know, the settlement is exactly very similar, like Southern Tyrol, um, Alto Adige for the people who prefer. You can call it then in the future Nagorno Karabakh or Akhtash. Yeah? It is totally uh, fine uh, that we have two names also for Southern Tyrol and for Alto Adige. And then uh, this, um, new, uh, this region is uh, part of Azerbaijan, will always stay. But of course, similar rights for education, uh, like for regional autonomy, like uh, international security, like we have it in Southern Tyrol. Works very well. It's the richest region of Italy today. And uh, the German speaking. Germans, Austrians, however you want to call them, they live freely there and prosperous and also to the Italians who live there. And this is obviously a complicated and uh, was very uh, toxic uh, the, uh, conflict as well there. And a lot of people died uh, in the issue of Southern Tyrol. It was one of the most terrible fronts in the First World War and it was very unjust and all these things. But now it's settled. Yeah and we can live in peace and the people especially there live in peace and prosperity in the European Union. So when it comes to Azerbaijan the same is true. I always since 25 years I'm in this debate I say you know when we have with Turkey this strong partnership and alliance in um, NATO and in the customs union what exactly is the difference between Azerbaijan and Turkey in that relation to Europe? Yeah? Azerbaijan was very happy to be the leader of the non-aligned movement yeah? and uh, has not, uh, man, uh, unfortunately Turkey has not developed very well in, uh, since 2013, but Azerbaijan has not even, is uh, not even developed into the, the level of democracy Turkey has in 2020. Yeah? So obviously, you know, non-aligned movement to live in the world of Tito's, yeah, and that's maybe for some a role model. But Azerbaijan has also to open up, to be a market democracy, to join the OECD like Turkey, to join uh, potentially, that's of course a longer term project, I'm not advocating neither for Armenia nor for Azerbaijan now, a NATO membership immediately. But you know, in the 2040s, it's for both totally possible. And that was of course the uh, final uh, security uh, guarantee like for Greece and for, for Turkey mutually, the NATO membership. 
But in the meantime, I'm meaning Azerbaijani. I said it very clearly. Join SEFTA, join the energy community, conclude a real DCFDA, a DCFDA like uh, Georgia has it, then leave this non-aligned movement, yeah? uh, treat yourself like a Turkey. If you love Turkey so much, why don't you at least, you know, uh, try to behave uh, like Turkey in many ways, yeah? Join the customs union, yeah? also open up uh, your political system. And as I call for Turkey as well, and for um, for um, uh, the, for Turkey and uh, for uh, Azerbaijan to really improve uh, and uh, back to the euro. That's very important for the economic stability. Cut your corporate tax and income tax to 10%, like it should be for a reform country post-Soviet, and also build a stronger strategic partnership also with Albania and recognize obviously Kosovo. Completely ununderstandable by a country. Anyhow, Azerbaijan is quite active investing in Montenegro, has a, some uh, a petrol partnership with Albania already. Why you have not recognized Kosovo is beyond my understanding. It obviously is connected with uh, Nagorno Karabakh, but you know, you cannot just, you know, uh, be like Spain and uh, your internal fragilities and misunderstand them completely. It's time to get serious. And then I said already, federal Azerbaijan with. Uh, Uh, These uh, nine regions, I hope I'm correct now with the nine regions, not that I make a mistake, I just check it. It's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, yeah, exactly, eight regions. I'm correct on that one. And then uh, to make sure that uh, Nagoni Korbach has a minimal compliance towards the Federation of uh, uh, as, uh, Federal State of um, Azerbaijan, but to be inside. And that's much better than the current status, obviously. And then to build the Southern Caucasus Benelux, you know, uh, infrastructure interconnectivity, let the Europeans, Americans, Chinese even uh, support uh, that. And also my favorite place, uh, always for the Caspian Bridge to Turkmenistan or and Kazakhstan, and make sure that this is a very important project to bridge uh, and the, or maybe to tunnel. That can be also a case. It's very wide, obviously, the Caspian Sea, a complicated one. I was criticized for that being a dream, but it's technically possible to build it. And the Chinese do 150 uh, kilometer bridges, and we can also do that. You know, maybe it takes 100 years, but let's get started with the planning, with the funding and let's start to get this implemented. It's at least, you know, uh, maybe a longer term project, but short term already to have a dialogue EU-Turkey with the Southern Caucasus and to settle and then uh, Turkey, Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan. It's much um, better to spend your very limited fiscal resources on um, building infrastructure than on uh, fighting useless war which no side will win and there will be almost I, maybe the front can be changed with uh, 10 kilometers yeah but the technical military capacities of none of the states is really able in a hostile environment uh, in a complicated uh, uh, geography of this Bergkarabach to change uh, the present demarcation and to hold it uh, for more than some kilometers and then to be pushed back. So it's a completely utter waste of uh, tax and life and of uh, political attention. And it's really a time for peace. So European Georgia, what needs to be done? Of course, uh, Georgia is the most advanced and the most, uh, in a way, European country of all three. It's the most, uh, it's the best reformer in doing business, in Transparency International, economically, but also it has uh, done all these tremendous uh, efforts after uh, the, uh, the Rose Revolution and uh, this was really enormous uh, progress. But on the European uh, main, uh, what is now needed in the 2020s, really to join the European Union and NATO, Obviously, it is a little bit hesitant to give up more sovereignty because the way to do it is obviously to join the Southeastern European countries and to really be a EU candidate country to back uh, the uh, currency, the lari, to the, uh, to the euro, and like Bulgaria did it, or to adopt the euro completely like Montenegro and obviously to recognize Kosovo and to get out of this uh, post-Soviet kind of context and to be a real European reform country like uh, Croatia, like Macedonia, 
And that would be the good thing. And of course, Georgia would be the ideal position to headquarter such a Southern Caucasus Benelux. Uh, it should be organization as well. Maybe best to be like a Guam or like RCC, but maybe to be a one pillar of RCC. That's my favorite uh, variation. But to have RCC headquarter one in Kiev and one in Tbilisi, and, um, and then to really work together to build a uh, strong alliance of all countries who want to join. And as I have said many times, the whole issue, once the prosperity, democracy and freedom is established, yeah, then all these breakaway countries, which are basically an, in a very problematic economic situation, they will understand, uh, the citizens will see the prosperity differential. And it's like this, it was in Eastern Germany as well, Once the difference is so high, then on the South Ossetia and uh, the, um, Abkhazia, they will join Free Federal Georgia. That's the idea. Of course, they have then to be under a moment when Russian power is weaker, but it will come. One day, there will be the moment again, like in the 90s, uh, after Putin, and then there will be the moment for unification. But you have to first get so attractive... <laughs> Uh, Azerbaijan must be a real market democracy and a real prosperity for everybody and uh, then Georgia as well must be a, a free federal state also with the euro inside uh, the euro accession, NATO accession parameter and uh, then the prosperity will come as a result of that security and that economic framework. Very much European Georgia. I have made uh, many um, tweets on that one and this slide, you know, the way is Bulgaria to reform like Bulgaria. Maybe not in the, in the corruption mechanism, that was a negative aspect of the summer. Um, not every country is totally perfect, obviously, you know. There's always things to be improved. But Bulgaria is double as rich in GDP than capita, has this currency back, has a 10% income tax, has full ma land market openness, is fully integrated in NATO EU and was before in SEFTA and in all these regional organizations. It's, you know, it's uh, unbelievable more developed in more, and it has recognized uh, also Kosovo. So in, recently uh, there is a lot of um, talk what is the right ro role model. Obviously the Georgian reforms of the 2000 are very good in many ways of public sector. But when it comes to uh, the um, main reforms, which also Georgia has to do, uh, then it's really Bulgaria, which basically on the main parameters, on the fundamentals, yeah, like currency, like trade, like defense, uh, like uh, the big property rights issues of land, these are the fundamentals of economic reform. And Georgia and Bulgaria did everything much better than Ukraine or anybody in the Southern Balkans, uh, by Caucasus. So I want to explain in detail European Southern Caucasus Benelux, you know. These are the three countries to really work together like the Benelux countries, like Belgium, the Netherlands and Luxembourg. And everybody who knows about European history knows that this was also a very troubled region between two superpowers of the time, the Germans and the French. And the British, if you want, it was completely squeezed, yeah? similar like now the Southern Caucasus between Iran and uh, the um, Turkey Ottoman Empire and the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. Obviously, you know, the parallels are very, very clear. And uh, there was a lot of internal conflicts. If you look today at the borders of uh, the Netherlands, uh, it's quite astonishing with Maastricht in the south, you know, all this overlapping and the small Luxembourg has somehow also survived all these European uh, efforts of uh, war to destroy it and to include it. It's totally, you know, Benelux is a miracle uh, and it's a miracle of prosperity and freedom as well. And by the way, they have done the European unification already before Europe unified. They were in the core of European six uh, to do the European project, but they were always a bit ahead. And, you know, this role model should be also, uh, when you see overcoming also religious hatred, you know, there was so much religious hatred between the Belgians and the Dutch and, you know, cultural, ethnicity, everything is totally mixed up in this very densely populated Benelux. And, you know, then you think, oh, if we are the most special conflict region of the world, we have to solve it by war. No, there is a better way. There is the Benelux role model. 
and we have all the mechanisms now to help with the southeastern European uh, mechanisms to stabilize and that's the way basically and it's for everybody's taxpayers and life and security prosperity much better to go into that direction and to establish um, Southern Caucasus um, Benelux. Yeah. So how to, how to solve the Nagorno-Karabakh, which is of course the biggest issue uh, in the region at the moment, but uh, there is obviously, I have talked already about South Ossetia and about um, Afghazia, they are obviously completely connected uh, to Russian power, but also that one is connected uh, to Russian support for Armenia. But uh, I want to explain how we in Europe uh, solve these problems. Yeah? And it is exactly no land swaps, no border changes, yeah? and international guarantee based on federalism, constitutional guarantees, and uh, then a free federal um, uh, Armenia, free federal Azerbaijan, and then there can be a gradually a reintegration of uh, Nagorno Karabakh, Akdash into a free federal Azerbaijan with uh, guarantees by UN, NATO, and the EU and massive uh, support uh, mechanisms. And that's, I think, uh, the better future than trying vain, uh, inglorious uh, wars. Uh, leading to no results in any uh, progress in prosperity or in borders or livelihood of the people, just leading to costly destruction, which can be done very fast, but which will lead to no results at all. So the better way is really the Benelux way, and uh, then uh, there will be much better results for all sides. Yeah. How to do it at the South Tyrolean status for Nagorno Karabakh, uh, Artashk, uh, it's the Armenian name. So, how to do it? It's basically a regional autonomy status inside Italy, which is guaranteed by the UN and also by all, both partners, Austria and Italy. And it's a very substantial autonomy package with their own regional parliament, with the language rights, with the quota for employment with the university access uh, issues, with the public employment and everything, you know, every detail is already regulated, yeah. And it uh, was never easy to do it, yeah. There were Austrians going to throw bombs in South uh, Southern Tyrol in, uh, the, in the 80s still, in the 70s for sure. It was really a terrible conflict and it was uh, really very complicated, emotional, uh, between the Austrians and the Italians and it's now completely disappeared in harmony and you know this is the way I think it's possible uh, to ensure obviously with a UN mission, with a OSD mission and with international support and massive uh, financial support for all sides to be successful and to be reintegrated. But in the short term what can be done by the EU already is uh, from the same from Kosovo, Belarus and Armenia, Azerbaijan are the last four countries which have no visa-free regime to Schengen and that's uh, something the EU should have done already in the beautiful um, months uh, we, uh, we have you know, wasted uh, since uh, the summer because this is a powerful incentive for peace and I call now on the EU Uh, give uh, the Belarusians uh, the visa-free access because otherwise we are guilty for them being jailed by uh, Lukashenko. They at least should be able to escape. If he jails them, we cannot do a lot. Yeah? But we can definitely, the ones who want to escape to Lithuania, Poland or the EU, we can allow them in and give them residence rights and work permits and uh, offer them some support in the beginning because they are really political asylum seekers and support them and uh, make sure that there will be a visa free um, for, Sh uh, for Belarus immediately. Same obviously for Kosovo long overdue, but also for Armenia, Azerbaijan. This is very logically call for peace, offer them visa free travel. And that's a um, big incentive uh, for the populations to say, let's focus on us and our um, um, livelihood and not to let us drive into a nationalistic war frenzy uh, from our um, current political elites. Yeah? yeah, I have made also for the Schengen Day already and the 14th of June I called for Armenia and Azerbaijan to be included into that list. It's very logical and they are really our e ERB partners 
I cannot see what we have uh, to wait on that one. It would have been so logical and maybe the whole summer escalation would have been avoided. And this war now as well with a little bit of better leadership and a little bit of more openness from our EU uh, elite. Yes, for the currency union, I said it already very clearly. You know, we had, I will also go in more details when you see the crisis of the Georgian uh, currency. It's the best of the six in the ARP, but it's a, a major decline. Azerbaijan is also in decline, losing half the value or something, yeah, 40% of the value. And uh, in the Manat, that's a currency. And also the Armenian uh, uh, currency, yeah in decline. Not as bad, you know, the worst in the of the six countries are the, uh, the worst is in Europe is obviously the Belarusian ruble, but also the Ukrainian Rivna is really a disaster, yeah, and when you look from 2008 on. But this uh, all three uh, Southern Caucasus uh, currencies have lost between half and 30% of the value in the last decade towards the euro. So what exactly, why should anybody keep such currency? It's totally a mystery for me. So first pack to the uh, to the euro and later join the eurozone uh, after you adopted the euro first to adopt it. It's much better for your consumers. It's much better for the investors, for foreign direct investment, for any economic decision. If you base it on sand, it's a disaster. And currency which have, and countries which have currencies which are in one currency area rarely attack each other. Orientate yourself to Lithuania. Estonia, they have done that from the day one after the transition. First back to the dollar, when the euro came, back to the euro, and then as fast as possible into the eurozone. And the progress of coming from the Soviet Union, less than 30 years of freedom, and then they have achieved such a prosperity level. It's unbelievable. <laughs> and it's fact. You can just go. And it was in the same Soviet Union. And they were also uh, heroes of transition and of reform, and they have managed. So it's a mystery why the Southern Caucasus uh, think they can go it alone. If you are on this kind of uh, uh, fragility, uh, like the Balkans, the Southern Caucasus, you do have to anchor yourself into a currency union. You know, the Turks are in decline, and the Russians are in decline. Do you want to decline with them, or do you want to stay stable and firm with the Europeans? That's the choice here for the currency and it's part of the whole strategy to join all these European mechanisms which we built up for these fragile transition countries and they are meant to help and then to mature to join the European Union if that's possible and then it was already possible for the Central Europeans, for the Croatian, for the Slovenians and Romanians, Bulgarians And we have all these specific sector reform organizations from transport to public finance, anti-corruption, energy, regional cooperation council is the bigger one, trade, SEFTA, and that's the way to do it. I've made the point about the currencies, decline, decline, decline. We have to stop that. Also, it's very interesting to see the tax rates because that shows how a country is really ready for for uh, reform and Armenia Azerbaijan are stuck in the last decade you know where 20 was cool now really it's uh, the Balkans has made much better reforms Georgia as well and here is really uh, the call for Armenia Azerbaijan in, or instead of uh, destroying uh, ammunition and lives on a demarcation line totally without any uh, long term effect but damage please focus on your uh, tax system and go down to 10% of taxation, be competitive in economics and not in war, because anyhow you will not achieve militarily anything. And the thing is here, the energy community already, it's uh, Armenia is associated members, Georgia full member, and here it would be, and Turkey is already, Azerbaijan thinks it's a very special country economically because of its energy wealth, and it is, it has of course a lot of energy Uh, power and uh, resources, but the more it would be much better to have it more uh, uh, reasonable managed because what we do is we don't take your energy wealth, but we help you to make your energy market, your gas market, your petrol market working in a normal competitive market economy and that the energy secretariat has a lot of competence and that would be really very beneficial for all your consumers and voters. Of course, you know, nothing can replace patriotic frenzy in the wartime 
and jingoism. I understand that that's very popular, and uh, you know, but it's tragic failure. And if you do a really re economic reform, you all Azerbaijanis will live much better, and that would be really very good. SEFTA is the ideal tool for all three countries to join. I made now a five years campaign, four years campaign of Georgia joining SEFTA. I was not successful. Maybe there is some wisdom now in this war because the situation is now so uh, uh, such a disaster. Maybe there's somebody will listen in Georgia and because it's the very logical situation for all three countries to be, uh, first of all, very softly united. And with SEFTA, we had also the antagonists and even enemies, Croatia and Serbia, Croatia and Bosnia, um, and Bosnia and Serbia. All these countries were in one way or the other in war with each other and they had also trade conflicts like Serbia and Kosovo. But they are all in SEFTA and at least this is a framework to get something done, you know. It's not the customs union, it's not so advanced, but it is a free trade agreement and it makes a lot of sense and it's really a good mechanism to settle on uh, trade disputes, open the borders and get the European standards in and that's really very good for all participants. Same is, to, is true for the transport union. I call it now transport union in this slide, but what I mean is the transport treaty based in Belgrade, which we have, the EU has established as, um, two years ago. And it um, was also following up on an older organization, on the transport observatory, but now it uh, has integrated. And it's very good for all um, Caucasus countries uh, to join this transport treaty and also the Berlin uh, for the Balkans interconnectivity and to build up their own subsection of that, the European Southern Caucasus Benelux Infrastructure Interconnectivity Initiative and to get all these beautiful things like highways, railways, energy, digital infrastructure very good connected um, to open the borders in a reasonable way and to have good customs clearance and checks and then this is really very beneficial and as I say, make uh, peace and trade instead of war. Yes, and get the Turkey obviously in because we anyhow need a big package for Turkey in order to convince the Turks to withdraw their candidacy for the European Union because that's politically impossible in Ankara and in the EU. There is no will for that. So we need a big package to help Turkey to smooth the pain and also to develop Turkey and to, to it's economically very good as a strong partner of the European Union as a NATO ally. So it's so important to make a big infrastructure connectivity package, develop all this Eastern Turkey-Armenian border, open the borders, make the links uh, towards Turkey and Armenia. And that's really very, very important to get uh, some decent infrastructure done so prosperity can replace war. Here comes the Southern Caucasus just a, uh, as a part of the Black Sea region and how important that is strategically towards Central Asia in this, and to connect it with Turkey and uh, to bypass hostile Russia and hostile Iran and also uh, hostile Syria. These are the three hostile states they have to face with and uh, then to connect with between allies that's really very important and also then uh, to Turkey to focus on what really matters <clears throat> if you want to help Azerbaijan and hopefully also the Syrians and reduce the refugee pressure from uh, the disaster uh, Assad and Russia have made in Syria. Please close uh, the Bosporus for the Russian Navy because after three months after you no longer allow so, uh, logistic supplies, supplies through the Bosporus, there will be no Assad regime anymore in Syria. And why to really, on the one hand, um, entice Azerbaijan maybe to make uh, this proxy war and uh, then uh, at the same time allow Russia to uh, do his own Middle East policy and do so much damage to the people of Syria and to the European political system. Never uh, forget how disastrous their uh, Russian intervention in Syria is. And obviously it's all connected to Russia and to, to the politics Russia has. And obviously this war, just to make the bigger context, is obvious, yes, um, current escalation yesterday is obviously connected to, to the Belarusian crisis because what everybody, what some want is to deflect and create another front in the Caucasus to deflect from the real crisis in Belarus. I have called already for peace in Europe. Let's not forget, I see that all connected also. We have to make sure that Cyprus 
is in the Partnership for Peace of NATO and is invited uh, to NATO in order to give up this uh, veto against um, uh, the Belarusian sanctions. And then we also have uh, hopefully a consensus with Turkey to close the Bosporus and uh, to support um, peace uh, between Azerbaijan and Armenia by including them into the European framework for Southeastern Europe. And then we will have a real um, um, also then for focus on the really very important topics which we have as well in order to uh, disentangle also Greece and Turkey uh, from this conflict about Eastern uh, Mediterranean gas because it's all, I have made a long presentation what to do and the energy re issue to reduce our dependency on Russia. This is really very important and we have to get uh, this gas in order to reduce and also Azerbaijani gas and towards the European market in order to reduce our dependency on um, Russia. Coming to the one of the last slides, I want to make the case, you know, Greece and Turkey, they have been antagonists, but they have now been without war between each other since uh, the year uh, 1952 uh, in NATO. And the Americans and, uh, and the NATO, but basically the Americans have managed to keep these really antagonistic countries uh, from each other's uh, uh, close uh, in uh, the last um, 70 years. And that's a major achievement. And I call, you know, that's maybe also the long term future from Armenia and Azerbaijan to be secured inside NATO. Maybe it may take 20 years to have this wisdom uh, understood and it maybe also needs a change in Russia. But uh, I see the long-term future in the 2040s of Armenia and Azerbaijan. Once they are both uh, market democracies, especially Azerbaijan has a lot to do. Armenia is reforming on that one. But uh, both inside NATO, that's probably then time for a peace treaty secured by their mutual Na uh, NATO membership. And it worked for Greece and Turkey and these are much more complex and much more dangerous uh, conflicts and it has been successful. Let's never forget my call to let uh, Russia not intervene in all this uh, because they have a very long-term tradition uh, tending back 150 years of heavy interve uh, intervention in, uh, in uh, this area in ancient Armenia, if you want, in the Ottoman Empire and all these things. And let's not forget, this has led to a lot of escalation in Europe and we should be wiser than in the past and not have Russian meddling in the Caucasus really lead to big wars. And uh, we should really um, uh, to, uh, make the, the redouble the effort for peace. And we have been a little bit sleepy over the summer, focused on Corona and other issues and American elections. And other negative powers have used this time to really ignite another war. And this is, of course, very terrible. I call everybody to end hostilities in the Southern Caucasus, to build the Southern Caucasus uh, Benelux, and to reform exactly like Bulgaria inside the structures we have built for the Balkans. And I call the European and NATO authorities to really help in these countries to disentangle their things, to get together in, in these uh, structures and uh, to help uh, where help is needed and help immediately now open the European uh, systems like Schengen uh, also financially to help to build this infrastructure to include them in the Berlin process or make a separate con uh, Berlin process for the Southern Caucasus. Fine as well if that's better but use the existing infrastructure of reform in the regional context that's much better than building up separate uh, infrastructures everywhere. And that's the better way to do that. And I call, everybody knew what's going on, 15th of July. And now we are 27th of September. Now it's the 28th. And again, we have to call for that. So we have to really be a little bit more proactive and not just to wait for the next escalation that we are interested in uh, focusing on, on that area, but really work systematically for peace in all Europe. Thanks a lot.